Well, hello everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm, I apologize for us being slightly late. Um, my name is Jamie Ho from the, from the Straits Times in Singapore. I have the privilege of moderating this very distinguished panel. Uh, let me just get straight into it, as I said, because we are slightly late. Let me introduce my panel. Uh, I have Prime Minister Han Duk Su from the Republic of Korea, uh, Kaiser Ollengren, the Minister of Defense from the Netherlands, uh, Foreign Minister Javier Gonzalez Olechea from Peru, and Mike Froman, the President of the Council on Foreign Relations, who obviously brings to him, brings to us a long service uh, in public service in the United States. Um, what I'll do is let me frame the discussion that we'll have today. Um, first, obviously, you've seen the title of this session. Uh, we'll talk about how the Pacific can and must continue to be the vanguard for growth, especially inclusive and sustainable growth for itself and for the world. Second, we'll also then talk about the unique sort of security aspects um, to which the world, and that's where the Netherlands probably provide a perspective, looks to the Pacific as well. Um, I'll ask this, these questions in the first instance to the panelists. They will have uh, opportunities to respond. Let me just say that I will, after their first remarks and their first answers, open the floor to questions from all of you. Um, it's my intention to have as much of that as possible. And then after that, we'll see whether there are follow-up questions, uh, and we'll keep this open and free-flowing as possible. Let me start the, uh, the conversation first with Peru. Um, Peru will have the very unique responsibility this year, uh, leading APEC. And I was very keen and very interested to see that they had a little uh, theme and uh, tagline to outline what they plan to do, empower, include, and grow. So I'm going to ask the minister to outline for us why he chose those themes to guide his presidency of APEC. Uh, and the floor, I now turn to you, minister. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Ho. It is a real pleasure and an honor to share this panel with distinguished speakers and with the audience. For Peru, it is a real challenge that we are taking on for the third time in the presidents of APEC, uh, and uh, we've been uh, favored with uh, chairing it in 2024. We, uh, this is the space of uh, greatest uh, growth in the world, and we believe that this is the, the best uh, possibility, the best opportunity among economies that make it up. I'm speaking about 21 countries in order to cooperate in the increase of investments on and uh, trade, because uh, as we understand things, there's uh, no possibility, there's no chance for development without uh, a flow of investment, without uh, understanding and valuing uh, private uh, companies at full and without respecting uh, conditions offered by each uh, country, and in my case, uh, conditions that are absolutely uh, stable in Peru and in equal macroeconomic conditions for national and uh, foreign investors. But this um, opportunity that is uh, given, being given to us uh, is something we don't want to project uh, to Peru. Uh, we believe uh, that uh, all economies uh, should benefit uh, from this uh, encounter that uh, has uh, three goals, three main uh, goals. That is uh, the uh, possibility for the host uh, countries uh, that is uh, has been fixed in the agenda, mainly to approach uh, trade and investment for an inclusive growth, and also promoting the uh, economic uh, transition uh, uh, from informal sectors to sector formers. Almost two thirds of the population of the world uh, lives in. Uh, uh, precarious uh, conditions, and this is not just a challenge for economies in the world, but uh, also for the uh, destruction of uh, jobs in this uh, disruptive era. And uh, 
where we see uh, three uh, factors, and that is uh, AI, the new ways of uh, communication and bioengineering, something that has uh, changed the world, uh, uh, creating uh, social uh, vouchers uh, that uh, put at risk uh, political and social governance, and, uh, uh, and finally, sustainable growth uh, for development, uh, because um, it's a good thing to differentiate uh, growth and uh, development, uh, but uh, nevertheless, to uh, uh, just uh, leave it as statistics uh, without uh, reflecting the reality in uh, each uh, country. And this is how uh, this was uh, approved uh, by the 21 uh, countries, uh, which uh, throughout the second week of December in uh, Lima uh, set as a priority agenda. But we know that this uh, forum also allows uh, to make uh, different proposals from different uh, perspectives in uh, different areas, and this is what we hope that uh, APEC uh, 24 will do. That is, we hope that it will come out of the box in order to promote cooperation, not just in uh, Asia Pacific, but we hope that this will be a great opportunity to tell the world that we are going to prioritize our trade and investments, but we want to be part of uh, global solutions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I, we, we are quite fortunate to have uh, Korea has, uh, here as well uh, because they do take on the presidency immediately after Peru. So I'm going to ask uh, the Prime Minister to provide his perspective on what his goals are. But obviously, at the same time, the, uh, Korea has put forth a quite coherent Indo-Pacific strategy, which I think will out, uh, sort of frame their approach to the region in the coming years as well. So I wanted to uh, ask him to take the floor now to talk a little bit about uh, Korea's perspective. Maybe bring in, I suppose, as, as a good segue to talk a little bit about your perspectives on security and climate issues, and supply chain issues, if, if you may, and maybe frame everything in the, the again, a very nice tagline that you have uh, framing your Indo-Pacific strategy, which is free, peaceful, and prosperous. Maybe talk about the free and the peaceful part as well, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to, first would like to emphasize and uh, that I was surprised recently that, yes, in the, uh, previously there was a rather more coherent emphasizing of the importance of this region. But as we went through some of the countries, now many European countries are very much interested in, in Indo-Pacific, and they actually publicly uh, you know, presented their Indo-Pacific strategy, including France and others. So uh, this Indo-Pacific region is now getting a renewed attention, quite a little bit different from the previous one. But uh, two things are clear in this region. One, uh, this is the most economically dynamic region. And second, uh, this region has the elements and the characteristics of diversity uh, from a very high-tech, advanced, technologically uh, you know, advanced country to the countries who think that uh, they are being left behind, and also the countries with uh, great resources while the others are very, very much poor in their uh, natural endowments. So, uh, but one thing is clear, this region, because of its diversity and its uh, dynamic characteristics of their growth process, mainly from globalization, not uh, enforcing more regulatory framework or you know, restraining some of the private initiatives, but always uh, we went into, into the uh, you know, characters of uh, market economy, globalization, cooperation, and cooperations with the world. Uh, I think that there are three elements now at this juncture uh, we can emphasize in this region. The first one, the fact uh, that was taken for granted that globalization will continue 
it should be subject to some kind of, uh, you know, a little bit uh, different uh, way to look at, at that uh, globalization. Geopolitical situations are changing in this region. Uh, w whether we like it or not is a fact that we must uh, take for granted. Then certainly some responses should be made. And this uh, supply chain, uh, whether I should say disruptions, but some supply chain uh, you know, the challenges are actually occurring in this region. And some kind of uh, dynamic shifting of their uh, or relocation of their production consumption uh, you know, structures should change. Uh, so uh, this region uh, is subject to, uh, the, to the exposure to the result of the uh, you know, you know, uh, global supply chain shifting. But at the same time, without this region, the acceptance and, and accommodation of, uh, to respond to that you know, the supply chain shifting, uh, it, it will be a little bit hard for this region to go to completely very different uh, continents or uh, the, to the countries very far uh, from uh, this region. So uh, the problem is occurring here and this region should be subject to uh, accommodating those, uh, you know, impacts uh, in a minimally, uh, you know, uh, frictious way, I should say. That's the uh, challenge uh, we, sh we are now, uh, w we should uh, address in this region. Of course, intergovernmental as well as private cooperation is important in taking this issue into a more acceptable level of accommodations. Uh, businesses are understanding the issues and uh, at the government level, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, some kind of Indo-Pacific economic framework of prosperity, supply chain agreements uh, that, that are actually uh, uh, acting uh, to address uh, these issues. The second uh, issue I'd like to uh, emphasize is how to address the climate change as, as a as a whole of this region, but also as an individual country. Uh, you know, th this region accounts for 60% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the key, yes, we have a lot of areas that we should uh, you know, react to this kind of uh, quite, uh, quite unfortunate fact, but the most important one will be the energy transition. And I don't think that this region is so good at uh, renewable energy, uh, solar or, or uh, wind. Uh, they still have a lot of challenges uh, to make a real dent uh, in energy transition. So I'd like to pro propose a new initiative by Korea which was made public at the General Assembly session by our presidents, which is called Carbon Free Energy Initiative. Uh, that is just a kind of a consultation body uh, which will uh, take into account all the general emission impacts of the sources of, of energy, not 100% limiting to solar and winds including uh, hydrogen, including uh, nuclear, and renewable, of course, and the new, uh, new sources of energy uh, that will emerge as in the process of uh, our technological breakthrough. So with this initiative uh, and by joining from a lot of countries and members of this region, we would like to make carbon neutral Pacific. Uh, we, we are also cooperating with Pacific Islands countries where climate change is an existen existential threat and Korea would like to be a green letter 
to bridge the climate gap. We will use our ODA and uh, Korea will increase its contributions to multilateral climate funds, uh, including gli uh, glow, uh, Green Climate Fund and uh, GGGI. The last point I'd like to make is that we should cooperate on reinforcing the platform, cooperative platform, for making our growth potential uh, you know, uh, in this region. And that is cooperation for sustained and inclusive economic growth. And importance of rule-based open and fair economic order, digital innovation, inclusive growth will be the main elements of the directions and ways we would like to pursue cooperations in this region for growth uh, in the future. APEC is very important. APEC has led uh, regional corporations through rulemaking, common vision, and action plan. And, and APEC set forth Putra Zaya Vision 2040 in 2020, three pillars, trade and investment, innovation and digitalization, sustainable and inclusive growth. So uh, we will cooperate on a collective as well as individual uh, basis by members. So uh, there's uh, some worries and concerns whether in this geopolitical uh, you know, situations, APEC uh, will be a, you know, capable enough to uh, draw some, some uh, agreements and so on. But in San Francisco, I really would like to commend the United States for its leadership in making, uh, under these uh, situations, making uh, uh, you know, agreed, agreed statements. Uh, which has a lot of very important elements. Korea will continue these efforts uh, next year, and we will we would like to leverage APEC again uh, on the basis of government as well as private partnership, and we would like to reinforce the cooperations among the private businesses in this region uh, with uh, close cooperation from the government. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Ollengren, if I, if I could now um, turn the questions to you as well, and I think you will provide a very interesting perspective as we sort of segue to include the talk about security issues uh, as a partner of the region look, from the outside looking in. Maybe you could explain the context to which uh, obviously the EU and your country, the Netherlands, has uh, very recently stepped up its cooperation and engagement with the Pacific. Um, tell us why, uh, why, why this is sort of a, a new step forward for, for you, and, and to what extent external partners such as yourself see the importance of the Pacific uh, in setting sort of the, the groundwork for the rest of the world? Well, thank you for that question. I think uh, for the Netherlands, it, it sort of comes natural because we have been a seafaring nation uh, for centuries. Uh, and that means uh, for us, uh, that principle uh, is something that we value very much because uh, free seas mean free trade. Uh, and the Indo-Pacific is an important region to us. We were one of the first countries to have such a strategy, as the Prime Minister of Korea mentioned, a strategy for the Indo-Pacific, and many other European countries have followed suit. And um, I think it's also important to show uh, our partners uh, in that region that uh, even now, as of course we are very preoccupied by the war in Ukraine, uh, that, that does not distract us uh, from continuing to be uh, a reliable partner to, to the countries in, in, the, in the Pacific and a credible partner to the countries uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific. And there are several reasons uh, for, for that. Uh, I think, first of all, because um, uh, the, the globalization and the interconnectivity is on every level and in every area. Uh, so as Minister of Defense, I deal with security issues, but you cannot discuss security issues without <coughs> thinking about uh, cyber and hybrid threats, without thinking about the economic resilience uh, that we need, or climate change, as was just mentioned. That is, that is really uh, interconnected. Uh, I think also for our global, global economy and the prosperity that we want uh, for, for people, uh, we need to uphold the principle of the free seas, 
uh, we have seen it. You know, the Black Sea, when it was um, uh, not free, uh, the whole uh, world was disrupted. Africa was directly affected uh, by uh, the fact that the grain from Ukraine couldn't pass through the Black Sea. Uh, and uh, that was a bit of a, of a wake-up call. Uh, we're seeing it today uh, in the Red Sea, uh, as the vessels cannot uh, pass through anymore, have to make a detour, it's two weeks extra. Uh, and that means that a lot of people are, are being affected by this, and business is being affected uh, by this. So the principle of the free sea is, is very important, and it's part of our rule-based order that we also must uphold. And the question is, how can we do that, and how can we cooperate with the partners uh, in the Indo-Pacific? So to give you a concrete example is that we have decided that we will dispatch a frigate every second year uh, to do the route through uh, the region. And it's much appreciated uh, by the countries uh, in the region. Uh, and of course, we, we do not come alone. We partner up with other countries, European countries, uh, United States, and of course, the countries in the region. Uh, and I think that is very uh, significant to contribute to the principle of, uh, of the free seas uh, and by actually showing presence, by actually reaching out, by cooperating, by doing joint <coughs> exercises uh, together. Uh, also to show that in, there is really not a far away. And that also means that if we ask something of our partners uh, in the Indo-Pacific, because we are concerned about something that happens in Europe, it goes two ways. Uh, we are, of course, very impressed by uh, the Republic of Korea and the defense industry uh, that they've built. And we now see also the necessity of having reliable partners uh, in that field. And that those partners, I mean, we talk a lot, lot about strategic autonomy in, uh, inside Europe. And I think that is something we have to work upon. Uh, but that does not mean that we turn a blind eye to those partners uh, who, uh, who are uh, extremely reliable and important and innovative. Uh, and the last point perhaps to make is uh, the geopolitical situation. I think we really have to take that in, into account. Uh, we see tensions building up in many places in the world. And I already discussed Ukraine, uh, Middle East, of course, uh, as we speak, uh, the Sahel in, in Africa, uh, but also in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and um, uh, be it uh, North Korea, uh, China, Taiwan, uh, the maritime presence in the South China Sea, there are so many uh, possible uh, threats uh, that could occur and that could lead uh, towards um, uh, further instability. Uh, to prevent that and also to work on deterrence, I think these partnerships are extremely important and we feel it's very, for us, it comes natural as a seafaring nation, uh, but also I think being part of the European Union, knowing the importance of this economic prosperity and knowing <coughs> how uh, economic prosperity and stability and thus security uh, are linked uh, to each other. Thank you, uh, Minister. Obviously, the Netherlands being a seafaring nation is obvious and close to the heart of those of us here well, from Southeast Asia, so glad to hear that. Um, Mike, I'm going to turn to you now, uh, and you are the only non-politician on this panel, so the question I'm going to ask... I represent you, diversity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question I'm going to ask you, therefore, may be a little bit more academic. Um, in, in making you sort of provide a perspective as well on the United States. Obviously, this is um, a complicated year for many of us uh, all around the world with elections. You will have one too. Uh, you see ongoing wars that are going on in the Middle East and in Europe. Um, with all this sort of as the backdrop, how confident are you that the United States will uh, continue to lead in the ways that, has, that have already been outlined by this panel economically, strategically, um, and, and what is its capacity to do so this year, and, and, and how would they do it? Well, let me start by building on uh, the Prime Minister's comments about the dynamism of the region. Uh, this region, and I'm defining it as the Indo-Pacific, the word half comes to mind. It is, it, uh, this, over the last few decades, this region has accounted for half global GDP growth, half manufacturing growth, half the growth in trade, uh, half of all patents, almost half of all research and development spending, half of foreign direct investment, uh, uh, half the, from a demographic perspective, half the growth in working age adults. Uh, it's a very dynamic region. Now, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have its problems. The demographics, it's grown a lot of working age adults, 
but many Asian countries, Pacific, uh, Indo-Pacific countries, face serious demographic challenges, including uh, Japan and, and China. Um, also, 97% um, of all of the global emissions growth come from this region. And yet, it's some of the most vulnerable countries in the world, the island nations of the South Pacific, who are facing uh, the challenges of climate change. I just say that by way of context, that the US has made it clear that it is a Pacific nation. And while it obviously maintains very strong alliances with Europe, and it's very strongly engaged in the rest of the world, the Middle East and elsewhere, um, it is also a Pacific nation. I think endemic or a, a symbol of that was the fact that even while these wars were going on, uh, President Biden did convene the APEC conference that the Prime Minister referred to in San Francisco and demonstrated the continuing commitment of the US to the region. The last few years has been this debate about in the region about don't make us choose between the US and China. Uh, Singapore, chief among those who, who, who make that uh, argument. I think we've actually sort of moved on from that argument in terms of US engagement in the world. I think we moved on for a couple reasons. One, I think there's more of a consensus within the Asia Pacific region, Indo Pacific region, of the nature of the China challenge, whether it's the use of economic coercion against Japan and Korea, or the, South, the militarization of the South China Sea, um, or the challenges to the Philippines most recently uh, on, on its uh, stake uh, in, in, in the South uh, China Sea, um, or the Belt and Road Initiative, which has been seen to have downsides as well uh, as upsides. The US, at the same time, I think has come forward with a number of additional pieces of ar architecture for the Indo-Pacific, uh, the Quad, AUKUS, the trilateral engagement with Japan and uh, South Korea, IPEF, uh, this new IPEF investment uh, mechanism to attract investment, focus on infrastructure, the global infrastructure initiative for the Asia Pacific. And I think rather than asking countries to choose one or the other, I think we're all getting used to a world in which there's not a China block and there's not a US block in the Indo-Pacific. But in, in fact, it's more uh, polyamorous, one might say, right? The countries, uh, I'll use India as an example since they're not represented on the panel. Mm -hmm. uh, India loves the United States for technology, for nuclear cooperation. Uh, it loves Russia for munitions. It loves Iran for oil. And I think we're all getting used to the fact that we'll be loved by some for some reasons and they will love others for other reasons. And all that does is point to the need to be much more, a much more complex world and the need to be much more sophisticated in how we engage in our relations across the Indo-Pacific. We can't expect people to be in one camp or the other. I think we're getting, the US is getting used to that to answer your question about the nature of US leadership. But we can provide alternatives and provide mechanisms to cooperate with others uh, where it matters most. The last thing I would say is, uh, and this I think has been very important really since uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, rise in, in, in Japan, uh, uh, the Asia Pacific is not waiting, and the Indo-Pacific is not waiting for the United States to coordinate it. ASEAN continues to strengthen itself. CPTPP continues to grow. Uh, Singapore has been a leader in developing digital economic partnerships uh, and, and agreements. Uh, and it's finding its own way to develop alternatives and to balance the other natural forces in the region, including China, uh, while attracting the United States to be continuously engaged. Thanks, Mike. Um, as I said, I, I was gonna open the floor up to questions after this, but you have another two minutes to think about them because uh, Minister uh, Gonzalez or the chair, you've asked for the floor to respond to something, which is very good, please. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I would like to build on what uh, Mr. Prime Minister of South Korea has said. He was talking about globalization, just like um, the minister from the Netherlands was saying, making emphasis on armed conflicts. At the same time, Mr. Froman was talking about mechanisms for cooperation. Well, besides all of that, I think that today, more than ever, 
Today, more than ever, we can paraphrase what a Nobel Prize award, uh, awarded uh, has said, which is that beyond war and beyond politics, we cannot deny reality. And possibly the mother of all battles will not be the current conflicts that are very serious, we must say. And we need to solve them. However, I think that the most important thing will be the consequences that derive from those conflicts. For example, for example, job reductions, um, illiterate, or, or what we could we can call a neo-illiterate people, people who lose their job after 50 years old and they cannot be reinserted into the working life. So, with all these armed conflicts, we are creating a world where inclusion will not find its place anymore. However, because we are experiencing many threats to social security in many countries, in just a couple of decades of this millennia, things have changed radically. Only we have foreseen, actually, that in 15 years old, jobs will disappear. Children going to school in America and preparing them, themselves for the future, when, they grew, when, they, when they're going to grow old, they will not be prepared for the new world. So this is disrupting uh, current and future markets, and it's creating this asymmetry of economics in uh, the region. So we are facing a moral dilemma. What should we do as economists and as governments? And at the same time, we have the possibility of managing in, in, in artificial intelligence and to make a good use of it. So this is an existential dilemma as well. As a conclusion, I would say that development and the uh, a better economy is are not enough. We need to focus on the social insecurity and injustice that we are living today, such as in uh, exclusion and uh, job losses. In Japan, for example, there are certain hotels with no workers, hotels that are managed by uh, an, an, an artificial intelligence. So this is a challenge. We need to increase the amount of investment, but at the same time, we need to find disruptive solutions and solutions that will provide us with alternatives to face the uh, world of the future. And so that uh, the people who were born during COVID are going to be able to face this new social Darwinism. That's the final comments that I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Um, I will now have a little bit of time questions from the floor. The only thing I would ask is when you do put up your hands, um, the mic will come to you and please stand up as you ask the question. Thank you. Um, hi, Brad Olson. I'm an economist from New Zealand and also one of the global shapers. Um, just a very brief comment before the question. I, I fear that the panel might have forgotten the second half of the Pacific that's in the south um, and I recognise that there's not many of us representatives here, but I guess a question to the panel, how do you see that engagement going with those countries that don't have as much resource, that don't have that much ability to be on the global stage? There's not representation here at Davos from Australia, from New Zealand, from most of the Pacific Islands. Um, you know, we are quite literally a world away. How do you see that engagement happening? Is it country to country, bilaterally? Is it through multilateral organisations, APEC, ASEAN? How does that engagement look as, you know, there is a lot of fraction in the region, there is a lot of concern, there is a lot of other issues. Uh, how do you engage with those other countries? Thanks, thanks a lot. I think uh, the Prime Minister made reference to that as well in terms of the assistance and the focus that they, they will have Korea in, uh, as far as the Pacific Islands is concerned. But I'll, I'll probably make uh, the Prime Minister take that on if you could uh, and the floor if anyone else would like to take it on as well after that, please uh, let me know. Well, um, there is no single solution to this problem. Uh, we should do it on an 
individual basis, uh, you know, individuals, uh, individual countries that, that are in this region, and private sector is also very important in in reducing uh, reducing the size of the problems by cooperating with the with the government, and at the same time, in some kind of uh, you know platforms like APAC will be uh, quite an important uh, platforms for us to engage. Uh, we have been trying from 1989 through the APAC. We made a vision, we, we made a concrete uh, discussions on trade and investments, how, how, how to ensure inclusivity in that process. Uh, I don't think that we have been successful 100%. But we, the focus was always there. Uh, so, but what is good in this region is that, yes, there are some disparities and discrepancies among the members. But in overall, as uh, Mike has just said, we are getting stronger and we are uh, getting much better than before. We have some rooms for maneuver. So I think that uh, you know, on an individual basis through ODA and also, you know, cooperative ODA, I should say, maybe Japan, Korea, US can work together to uh, help those countries left behind uh, through various ways. And also individual countries, we can do it. Korea, this, time, this year, we increased 43% of our ODA mm -hmm. and by 2030, we will double uh, the current uh, you know, amount. And uh, Pacific I Islands countries are clearly uh, our, one of the main targets for creating and working platforms to work together. We had a, a summit meeting with Pacific Islands last year, May, and we will do it with some of the ASEAN members, yes. So, so I think that future is it's not so bleak. It's bright. And here, there is a potential, there is a willingness, and there is a, some financial you know, leveraging process so we can do it. Maybe I'll ask uh, Mike to help chime in as well, because I mean, when we look at the Pacific, and I, and I, and I sympathize with the question, because the, a large part of the Pacific, obviously, we look at in terms of the potential and, and the strength of the the main countries like United States and China and Korea in the Pacific. But on the other side, you have the Pacific Islands, uh, the South Pacific, who on issues like climate change will be the worst affected as well. Um, maybe take us back to your time at the USTR and in the administration, how you approach those questions in terms of um, approaches towards assistance in terms of strategic issues uh, for that part of the Pacific. Well, I, I think that, <coughs> excuse me, I think the, uh, those vulnerable countries are getting more and more attention. In fact, eight out of 10 of the most recent climate disasters came from this region. Uh, and you see a lot of competition for the attention of the Pacific Island nations between the US, China, other, uh, other forces in the, in, in, the, in the region as well are engaged with them to try and figure out how to take this forward. The World Bank under Ajay Banga laid out a toolkit for climate disasters, uh, very much with the small island nations in, in mind and how to make sure that they had what they needed in order to address uh, this. But it's going to be an ongoing set of issues, including what happens to in islands where it becomes increasingly uninhabitable. Um, I don't think of Australia and New Zealand as poor um, uh, nations in the South Pacific, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, New Zealand punches way above its weight uh, internationally, including on trade and on, on, on climate. And Australia obviously plays a very critical role, including on security issues around, uh, 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 around the world. We just saw it in the, uh, in the Red Sea, uh, their participation as well. But I think collectively, we all need to focus on the most vulnerable countries and do what we can in terms of mobilizing resources, um, finding ways of using blended finance. There's issues around you know, climate resilient debt 
uh, uh, covenants. I'm sure you know more about it than uh, than I do. And how to and, and that that work has begun at the MDBs, the multilateral development banks. But there's still a lot more work to be done to refocus their balance sheets and what can be done through insurance and other mechanisms to try and address the, their particular needs of adaptation. We've almost run out of time before I get to wrapping up. I just want to make sure that there's no one final quick question uh, to be asked. <coughs> I'm in Subaru, the Trade Minister of Papua New Guinea. Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for the panel. Um, I wanted to say this is uh, the leader of the Pacific in terms of the biggest nation of the Pacific. Sure. I want to re remind our audience, Papua New Guinea is a third of the nation's, the world's rainforest. We are the lungs of the world. Up to now, COP meeting after COP meeting, our people have not been able to monetize carbon credit or able to access any sort of funding from all these climate funds that we talk about. They all want to preserve forest. They want to support the world, but there's no incentive. We have a choice of deforesting, continuing to do logging operation, or to bring it to a halt and assist the world at this time. But right now, all the great nations like the US, they keep talking, they keep polluting, but we have the funds to support nations like ours, who are the lungs of the world. We want to do more, but there's no incentive. And this esteemed audience need to be reminded of that. The other factor, our small vulnerable island states were really affected by climate change. You don't see funds available to even build sea walls for that matter. No one is stepping forward to provide assistance in this area. They are, they are really innocent island nations and they're really being affected by major industrialized nations of the world and your actions to continue to pollute the environment. I think something more needs to be done. And I came here to echo their voice and to stress that the time for talking is over. We must see action now to support island nations who are really affected by climate change and to support nations like Papua New Guinea to preserve our forests so we continue to be lungs of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, on that note, I think your message has been heard loud and clear. I think at least the panelists here would be fully aware of the responsibilities and the next steps forward. Um, on that front, can I ask each one of the panelists? Um, unfortunately, these things, uh, time often flies and we wish we had more time. If you could recap, uh, if you imagine yourselves now in 2025, we're sitting here again in January and we're looking at sort of a post-mortem of how we did in 2024. Uh, would you see and how, what would you see in terms of the good news that will come out of the Pacific in terms of the leadership that it is going to provide, whether it is within the realm of APEC or external partners looking in? Um, give us a sense of what you hope to see uh, this coming year. Mike, maybe start with you and then we'll end with the Prime Minister. Well, I'd say if when we were here last year, uh, there was a lot of concern, a lot of discussion about the US-China relationship around decoupling, et cetera. And I think this year, um, we've already seen some significant progress in terms of stabilizing the relationship based on the summit meeting that President Biden and President Xi had in November in, in California. I think one of the areas of potential good news, while there's so much other less than good news out there in the world, is that the US-China relationship may be stable throughout 2024 and that hopefully in 2025 we can continue to build on that stability to actually make progress on outstanding issues. Very good, thanks. Minister. So you talked about leadership. So you were, you, you were talking about leadership, how our leadership is going to be in 2024 and 2025. And uh, here I come with my own perspective, the perspective of a very peaceful country, a country with a long-standing tradition for peace. We consider that hegemonic leaderships and individual leaderships should 
open the way for a collective leadership with shared values, avoiding the dichotomy between what we say and what we do. Let me give you an example. Yesterday, in a closed session, sorry, I cannot disclose uh, the comments that were spoken and who uh, said those comments. But I can tell you that one of the participants said that there was this, like, this double standards because people make wishes that concern everybody, good wishes, best wishes for everybody. However, when we look at what they do, we see a very big difference. And that difference also remains in the public opinion. So I would, I, I, I would prefer a shared leadership, a collective leadership with shared values. And this does not imply becoming a big, powerful country but having the moral authority and the exemplarity of doing what we say and saying what, you, what we do. So in 2025, I would like for this shared and collective leadership to be appreciated and shared at the end of the day. Excellent, thank you. Minister Ollinger now, what's your perspective? Well, um, as a Minister of Defence, of course, mm -hmm. I see that uh, defence spending in the Indo-Pacific is, uh, is on the rise. Uh, I also see alliances that are, are being, being formed and, and, and tensions that are there, rising, diminishing, but still there in a very complex situation. So I think it, it's crucial to have uh, dialogue, uh, continued dialogue also between our part of the world uh, and the Indo-Pacific, United States, and, and all countries involved. We have uh, the European Union and, and NATO, two organized contexts in which we can have that dialogue also with other parts of the world. It's, it's extremely important to keep that going, I, I think. Uh, but the most important thing is that we all agree uh, on the rule-based order, uh, and that we all agree uh, that uh, we, can, we can have our differences and we, have, uh, um, we make different choices as nations and as countries, but that we all uphold this rule-based order because it profits all of us, uh, every single uh, country. Uh, and that would be my wish for, for next year, uh, that, there, that we have that common base, that we have that common ground uh, and that leads us towards, uh, well, maybe increased defense spending, but also in the understanding that uh, military conflicts usually don't solve uh, things. Uh, they only in increase uh, instability and uh, lead to different questions on how to stop military conflicts. So for deterrence, yes, but for actually starting military conflicts, that would be a very, very bad step. Thank you. Thank you. Prime Minister, you have the final minute of this panel. Well, on a macro terms, I think next year will be much more price stabilizing year. And, uh, uh, you know, with the subsiding of the inflation, the very high interest rate will, be, will not be accelerated. On the basis of that, I think some countries in this, in this Pacific countries like Korea will put more emphasis of its policy on some kind of solidarity and we will work more closely with Pacific Islands and uh, ASEAN members, mainly in digitalization processes, how to make, how to contribute uh, to not increasing the disparities but uh, contributing in its own way with the projects with those countries that they are not be left behind in this uh, in this AI world uh, which will be critically uh, will emerge as a as a uh, you know a great uh, great uh, equalizer thank you thank you prime minister thank you distinguished panelists all of you I'm sorry we extended a little bit over time but thank you much for very much for staying with us. Thank you. Thank you very much.